All right, I see people are coming in. We'll give folks the time to come on in. Welcome everyone to Tech Power to Economic Power, Closing the Digital Gender Gap. So glad that you could join us. Hope you all are enjoying uh, all of the events for the 67th Commission on the Status of Women. We appreciate your participation. All right, I see we're going to give folks time to come into the room. Okay, welcome, welcome. All right, wait another minute or so. Give everyone a chance. Thank you, LaToya. We are so glad that you are joining us today. We really appreciate it. All right, okay. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Once again, welcome to Tech Power to Economic Power, Closing the Digital Gender Gap. Um, I'm Gloria Blackwell, AAUW's Chief Executive Officer, and I'm joined by three of our amazing fellowships and grants uh, recipients from AAUW. I want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, just a reminder that this program is being recorded and it will be available on our aauw.org website. Um, please feel free to use the chat box if you have any technical questions and um, the Q&A if you have any questions for our speakers. We did get some great questions that were submitted beforehand, so we will be um, reviewing those thoughtful questions and many of them have been woven into our presentation this afternoon. So let's get started with a few opening remarks. So AAUW is an organization that for over 140 years has been advancing equity through education, advocacy, and research. We have always been a staunch supporter and provider of increasing girls and women's access to science and tech through our groundbreaking research, advocacy, our education, training, and our funding opportunities. For example, our STEM Ed for Girls program prioritizes providing high school girls and their parents and caregivers with information and engagement to increase their understanding of STEM careers and educational choices to build a strong STEM pathway. Through our fellowships and grants, we funded over 13,000 women from over 150 countries to pursue higher education. And across the United States, our dedicated, loyal, local AAUW affiliates play a critical role in providing STEM education and programs for girls. Access to education that leads to tech careers, which tend to be higher paying fields, can increase women's economic mobility and advancement and provide meaningful impact on the lives of women and their families. The digital divide has become the new face of gender inequality, as so many speakers have identified during this session of the 67th UN Commission on the Status of Women. Women and girls are a major disenfranchised group excluded from digital society and the digital gender gap is one more barrier for women to overcome on a global level to achieve economic advancement for themselves, their families, and their communities. For example, the share of internet users is highest in Europe and in the Americas and lowest in Africa. And there are gender disparities in those numbers. In Africa, for example, only 34% of women have online access compared to 45% of men. And in Asia and the Arab regions, women's access is also lower than men's. So worldwide, women's use trails men's, and women are still 15% less likely to own a smartphone than men in low and middle income countries. And even when girls and women do have access to technology, 
Too many encounter online harassment and violence that creates unsafe and unwelcoming environments. Throughout the Commission on the Status of Women, we've heard the powerful and disturbing experiences shared by girls and women worldwide regarding the trauma and the harassment that they face. Gender biases and stereotypes offline are reflected and exacerbated online blocking women and girls' participation and progress. But we've also heard the shining examples of empowerment that technology can bring to their lives. The COVID pandemic in particular accelerated the use of digital technologies and online communication across all areas of life, including education, the economy, government, and our social lives. It also highlighted the disparities in some cases, and in some cases, expanded opportunities. Now, in an increasingly digitalized world and economy, access to technology and digital literacy are essential to women's and girls' social and economic empowerment, and access to banking, education, and healthcare have transformed women's lives. As technology and innovation develop more rapidly than ever, how can we ensure that women and girls are no longer left behind? Let's get started with our exceptional panel of AAUW fellowship recipients. I'll start with Gulnaz Kordanova. She's a founder and CEO of the NGO Connect-Ed.KZ, which works to bridge the digital divide through the collection and distribution of laptops and other equipment among school children in need. Gonaz is pursuing her master's in education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Prior to attending Harvard, she has experience in teaching, conducting community-based participatory action research, and launching a number of social projects, including NGO Teach for Kazakhstan. Gulnaz is a laureate of 2022 Forbes 30 Under 30, Kazakhstan, where she was recognized for her achievements in the field of education and social work. She is a passionate educator, community builder, and advocate for quality education for all. Welcome, Gulnaz. Next, we have Dr. Alicia Hayes. She's an assistant professor of learning technology at the University of North Texas and the director of the Simulation User Research and Game Experience, or SURGE, VR lab, where she leads the development and testing of technology for learning. As an educator, researcher, and developer, Dr. Hayes focuses on emerging technologies, including virtual reality and mixed reality, gaming, and gamification. Her passion for broadening participation in STEM for underrepresented students in K-12 schools, as well as students in secondary schools and in the general public, has led her research agenda to include application of her research to STEM engagement and mentoring. Welcome, Dr. Hayes. Next, we have Dr. Sarah McLenolty, who is currently the Executive Director of Skype a Scientist. It's a nonprofit that connects over 10,000 classrooms to scientists every year. Dr. McLenolty, a squid biologist, received her PhD in molecular and cell biology, working on Hawaiian bobtail squid symbiosis in 2019. A prolific science communicator, Dr. McLenolty has been featured by Nature, Forbes, NPR Shortwave, along with many others, for her work and has an active presence on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. So welcome to our AAUW Fellowship recipients and our STEM and tech panelists for today. Let's get started. So earlier, I shared some statistics on the global digital divide, which presents one of the most urgent issues for gender equality today. Let's start with a question for all of you. In your experience, why does the gender digital divide exist? And what are the implications if this gap is not closed? Who wants to go first? Uh, 
Okay, I'm happy to go first. <laughs> thank, thank you, Dr. Hayes. Um, first, I'd like to say thank you so much for being included in this panel, and I am so honored to be here with you and with these awesome panelists, and also very honored, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, but very honored to have been able to fund my uh, summer camp through the American Association of University Women. I can't express um, in the time we have enough how transformational it has been for my career and also for the students that I work, have worked with and continue to work with, so um, thank you. And of course, I would echo everything that Gloria has said about the lack of access, um, about stereotypes, gender bias, the risk of violence against women um, in these spaces. And I see these disparities with the students in the K-12 schools that I've worked with and even the um, undergraduate students and even graduate students that work in my lab. So I also have two daughters and in this culture right now, they're even experiencing kind of blowback from people who are saying things like, well, why are there, why are there summer camps just for girls in STEM? And I don't understand, is, is that still a problem? Like, I don't, I don't get it. It's, and, and even so much as some of their male counterparts being actually frustrated and approaching angry about some of the opportunities that they have. So there is still a, a, a blindness to the gender gap outside of the people who are working towards fixing. It. So I think that's that's one, one of the things and I continue to experience that. I, we, we've been working on this digital divide for my entire career, but it still exists. And it, we're making tiny steps forward, but also sometimes taking tiny steps back. Um, and I also would say, specifically based on the grant funding that we have, now a lot of girls have had the opportunity to experience technologies that they wouldn't have. Like I'm able to bring them because of the AAUW grant funding, I'm able to bring them VR experiences, I'm able to teach them about augmented reality, I'm able to teach them about levels of immersion and user experience testing, all things that are very possible career fields that they can go into that will increase their earning potential and leverage in the communities that they live in. Um, so I absolutely see the uh, gender gap still existing. And I also can continually talk about how much economic power we can provide to communities just by addressing this. And, and I, I, I don't wanna talk too much at the beginning, but I will just say um, closing the gender divide is crucial for promoting gender equity and empowering women and girls to participate fully in society. So I often tell young women if they're like, I don't know if I really love this like technology. And I say, well, you might not love it, but you do have to understand these tools because even if you want to be a teacher, if you want to be an activist, if you want to you know, um, work in nursing, any of these other fields, these technologies are here to say they're part of our world and your ability to leverage them also gives you power in this world. Yeah, I completely agree with everything that was just said for sure. Um, and another thing is uh, that I think about a lot is uh, when we get online, this is a, the space that um, lately we've used the most to um, kind of share our ideas, share our perspectives, and where large groups of people, including decision makers, are uh, informing their opinions and how to move forward, whether that's political power, whether that's community groups locally, um, et cetera. So if all of the folks that are gained access to those those spaces, to those conversations, um, are, are not women, uh, we're going to cut out a huge portion of of that group and we'll probably talk about this um a bit later as well but um the harassment faced uh by women and other gender uh, minorities uh in these spaces can also be uh, a prevention once you have access to uh, and i think we're going to probably cover that later but um if we need as many diverse voices as possible in these conversations so that we're uh, we're making the decisions that include everyone um, and not just those that have historically had power. Absolutely. Thank you. Gunas? Yeah, thank you, Gloria, Alicia, and Sarah uh, for this. And I think I, I'm, I'm going to speak uh, in terms of Kazakhstan and which is true globally as well when the digital divide exists due to economic factors, cultural attitudes, and the social norms, especially in 
the in my country so in case of Kazakhstan and it was only yesterday we had the equal pay day which is also influencing how women are still in the poverty and like uh, getting lower levels of pay uh, making it more difficult for them to afford and advance the digital services and uh, one more thing is the cultural attitudes that we have and gender stereotypes uh, that women is still struggling to access technology um, comparing to their male counterparts and like social implications I want to highlight in this case as Sarah said um, that women are more vulnerable to the um, harassment in the digital space and all of that um, have wider social implications that turns to wider like economic mobility so thank you for sharing Great. Thank, thank all three of you for kicking us off with those very thoughtful responses. And I think it's a good point to state that no matter what field anyone goes into these days, the knowledge of technology is an asset that certainly can't be, you know, can't be overlooked. And uh, technology has permeated so much of every aspect of our entire world that being knowledgeable and being, you know, fluent in and being able to use it is something that definitely changes the trajectory, the trajectory of your career, no matter what that career might be. Uh, so thank you all. So let's uh, move on. And we're going to start with Gulnaz. I want to ask you a, a few questions um, in relation to the work that you are currently doing. So if you could first start out by telling us a bit more about your organization, um, ConnectEd.KZ works to close the digital divide in Kazakhstan, and uh, what you found to be, you know, really effective strategies to ensure um, that, you know, women and girls have access and participation with digital technologies and education. Yeah, thank you so much, Gloria, for the space. And as I said earlier, I was really thrilled that um, this topic is one of the um, in the agenda today. And uh, Connected started in the midst of pandemic. We started in on April 8th when we realized that 300,000 students in Kazakhstan didn't have access to equipment to participate online. And we were um, in online learning for 11 months. Um, so it was one of the longest uh, duration for, for us. And uh, uh, we started our work by collecting um, equipment from individuals and companies that they renew every two or three years and tried to help to repurpose that equipment by giving it to underserved communities. Uh, but soon after we started to... Uh, redistribute this equipment, we realized that our students, their parents or teachers, they don't know how to use this equipment. So we started the program on digital literacy uh, by using the tools that are available for them, such as YouTube and WhatsApp. So for us, it was really important to remove the barriers of um, any tractions that will um, help like, and help kids, especially girls who are staying home and had uh, added uh, home responsibilities, such as taking care of their siblings and uh, helping with the household issues uh, to access the uh, programs without any significant time consumption. Uh, so what we do is we uh, create WhatsApp chats uh, with our students and send them a short instruction and the link to the YouTube videos that we have. So they can then follow up with the um, homeworks and uh, reach out to our coordinator and help um, to do their homework during the pandemic and we're continuing it beyond. Um, so, and besides that, we realized it's also important to educate adults. So we started to um, have programs for uh, their parents, adults, and uh, last year we had programs for seniors where we taught them how to use um, their uh, mobile phones so they are not um, vulnerable in the digital space and also not really dependent on other um, adults that they have. Um, so that's what we are doing and I think Connected is one of the first and unfortunately one 
only one uh, NGO that is working on uh, bridging digital divide in Kazakhstan, and we are bringing a lot of awareness and uh, uh, informing policies in Kazakhstan uh, to change the scene. That, that's pretty amazing. You have a pretty important weight on your on your shoulders and working um, on this particular uh, issue in, in Kazakhstan. And the pandemic certainly sort of forced the pushing of technology out, but it certainly was for you know good good results. So congratulations on your ability to make that kind of progress. That's really important. Um, and speaking of the pandemic, right? It really forced that shift, as you mentioned. You were they were online for eleven months, um, and it really revealed and it exacerbated right our existing digital divides. So, um, in your opinion, what? What roles do access to technology and digital digital literacy play in creating quality education? Yes, thank you, Gloria. Um, and yes, as I said, 11 months is a significant amount of time to be out of school. And uh, um, according to World Bank and UNICEF, Kazakhstani students had significant learning losses as every student did, but um, Taking into account the uh, socioeconomic and gender divide, uh, gender and also geographical divide that we have in Kazakhstan between urban and re urban areas, regions and rural areas, so uh, this was very important to act quickly. And I, I think that having an equipment is now such as the tool. Um, to have a, it's it's as a book, right? So without an equipment, um, they they don't have a tool to study. And the digital literacy, I find it as a as any other literacy, math literacy, language literacy that everyone needs to have right now uh, in order to receive the quality education. In case of Kazakhstan, while one of one half of the students um, continued to study through Zoom or Google Meet. Majority of our students study through WhatsApp um, by teacher by, by teachers sending them WhatsApp messages, very long messages. And I conducted this participatory research when they were um, describing their experiences of uh, studying online and in connected our uh, Kind of slogan or motto is um, we give access we give kind of access by um, this equipment so we don't see it as only the equipment but it's uh, access to the whole new world and opportunities where they can now research find extracurricular activities and which is not kind of is nice to have anymore it's must have um, and so I believe that in order to every student to realize potential, they need to have access to the equipment, the good quality internet, and the, have the skills how to use it. And not only them, the teachers who, who they are interacting with, uh, they also need to be very fluent in technology. Thank you. And that sounds a bit like you are, are veering into my next question, which is around um, digital empowerment. When you talked about the fact that, you know, it wasn't just a, a nice or thing to have, but it really is a necessary thing to ensure digital literacy. So how do you define digital empowerment? And how does how do you think that translates to economic empowerment, specifically for women and girls? Yes, I think um, the whole, like the end goal of the connected is giving our beneficiaries the digital empowerment through um, having them access to the technology and digital literacy skills and uh, enabling individuals to get this um, digital skills to effectively access quality education first of all and improve their lives and participate in the society um, so for women and girls I think this is a huge opportunity for them um, to be able to receive the quality education then go up to the higher education and for the even the women who staying uh, home on or uh, a caregiver right now uh, in Kazakhstan we have 
we see that entrepreneurial spirit when uh, women use social media platforms to kind of uh, advertise their products or uh, while they're in maternity leave to uh, participate in online learning. So all for all of that requires um, this basic uh, kind of foundations so they can be part of the digital, uh, digitally empowered world and uh, continue their um, kind of development and uh, not be behind uh, their male counterparts. Yeah, that's, that's such a really great point, because we know that during the pandemic, when everyone, you know, had to go home, whether it was for work or whether it was for going to school, that women obviously picked up, and all the research shows that women picked up a disproportionate amount of the, you know, the care at home, whether it was for, you know, elderly parents, children, the household. And so that was on top of everything that they were already doing in order to stay on top of their, you know, employment and the work that was required of them. Um, and so the, the ability to utilize technology in ways that provide additional access to, you know, potential um, funding opportunities or, or, you know, ways to bring in income is certainly something that definitely provides um, additional empowerment um, and economic empowerment for women. So thank you so much, Gomez. I'd like to turn now to uh, Dr. Sarah McAnulty. Uh, Sarah, can you tell us a bit more about your inspiration for founding Skype a Scientist? Uh, Skype a Scientist actually was around before the pandemic, I know. And if you can talk a bit about how it um, allows te the, te the technology allows you to connect with students and, and reach girls and young women in particular. Absolutely, yeah. So um, I founded Skype a Scientist back in early 2017. It was a time um, when a lot of scientists were really having it hit home harder uh, than before that um, the, the messaging we've gotten, um, we've been able to give out as a scientific community around climate change, among other things, had really not gotten to the number of people that it needed to get to. And what I was seeing among scientists um, was just like despair, um, anxiety, and a lot of that was leading to people just going on social media and sort of screaming into the void. Um, and I wanted to take all that energy and put it towards something actually useful. Um, I know that scientists are on the whole pretty busy people. Um, and so I wanted to develop a way for scientists to connect and communicate with non-scientists in um, and mobilize as many scientists as possible to make that happen. So that's when I developed Skype a Scientist. It was all about uh, using the limited time that scientists have to make meaningful connections uh, with folks. So we started with schools. We thought it would be a um, a pretty easy sell to, to teachers uh, and classrooms to um, have that connection. And it uh, took off very, very quickly without internet connection, it just would never have happened. Um, I want to make sure that if a scientist has aspirations to uh, engage with either local communities or communities far and wide, um, that if they if they have one hour to do it in a semester, that they're actually doing one hour a semester. If they have 10 hours, great, we'll use them. Um, but we want to make sure that we get the widest variety of people involved as possible. Um, now, when it comes to women and girls, um, we want to make sure that um, in the matching of scientists, to the classrooms, Girl Scout troops, libraries, whoever needs a scientist. Um, we wanted uh, to make sure that representation is taken into consideration here, not only with women and girls, but also uh, various historically excluded groups in STEM. So when teachers, librarians, scout troop leaders sign up for our program, um, we match everybody up for free with scientists. Um, they tell us who their group is. They say, you know, do you want a, a woman scientist to speak with your group? Do you want, um, is over half of your group from any of this list of historically excluded groups in STEM. So if we have a scientist from that same group, we can match them with that classroom or group um, because representation is, of course, so, so, so important. So we want to maximize the value of these um, of these interactions. Um, so, yeah, we I mean, we've, we work with Girl Scouts um, all across the United States um, and Girl Guides in Canada as well. Um, and uh, that works pretty well, uh, which 
uh, like many volunteering opportunities, about 65% or more, depending on the semester, of our volunteer scientists are women. Surprise, surprise. So um, getting a, a woman scientist to your group is always something that we can do. Um, and we make sure that if that's what folks want, we can get them that. Awesome. Um, when you So when you think about the work that you have been doing with Skype as scientists and with your other work, you know, obviously, um, you know, your work as a squid scientist is, is something that I'm, I'm sure takes up a little bit of your time. How have you encountered the digital divide as you've been working uh, as a scientist? I've been running into the digital divide most with my work um, locally and like local politics sort of in Philadelphia. So in addition to some science, in addition to the science communication, um, I'm also the vice president of the Fishtown Neighbors Association. I'm based in Philadelphia. Um, and a lot of what we uh, do runs into the digital divide I mean, like so much, particularly with, with our older neighbors. And so um, what I've realized is there's a lot of, I mean, citywide programs, but this also uh, ties into the science communication aspect too. These are equally uh, issues that I'm running into. Um, we have to just hoof it and post posters around the neighborhood. We've got to use bulletin boards. We need to um, drop off flyers in mailboxes. Like the, the programs that are the most needed, whether they're um, educational programs or city programs to lower, um, like, uh, how, like taxes, for example, for folks who have lived in this neighborhood for 40 years. There's one woman who lives down the street from me. She's making $17,000 a year. She's on a fixed income. Her, um, house tax was raised to 9,000 a year. That's not going to work. She used to pay like 500 a, a year. Um, and there's a city program to help her do that, but she doesn't have internet. And, and so you have to use an online form to get that exemption from the city. And so we're running into this problem a lot. The way we try to get around it as the Neighbors Association, yeah, flyers, uh, communicating among church groups, that kind of thing, um, word of mouth, um, a lot of posters. For the science communication, um, I've included tactics uh, as Skype a scientist, in addition to our social media platforms, in addition to emails and um, the online connections that we make, we've started doing street art too. So we just put science information right smack out um, on walls in the city of Philadelphia, um, on poles, on all sorts of stuff. We do a mix of murals, wheat pasting, which is like that, those like uh, posters that go up with wall paper glue uh, on like boarded up walls and all sorts of stuff um, and stickers to try to um, break through um, the divides that we have, whether that's access. And then also I'll promise, I promise I'll start to stop talking in a moment here. Um, the other thing is that I think about a lot when it comes to the digital divide is who is opting in to listen to a squid scientist on Twitter. It's probably people who uh, want to hear about squid biology, and that's not most people. Um, so even if I have a, a decent number of people listening to me on Twitter, on TikTok, wherever, um, who is that population? And is that is this population already overserved in science content? And how do we reach people who would not think to follow a squid biologist. And a lot of that is the, the street focused um, approach to communication. Really, really great points. And you remind me of how um, when, you know, vaccination appointments and clinics and things were set up during the pandemic and how so much of it was, you know, online or all you had to do was go to this online space to which everyone, you know, didn't have access. And, yeah. uh, you know, that points out, you know, such a huge, huge gap in uh, opportunity and, and access to be able to take advantage of these services, even services, right, that could do something as important as, you know, alleviating, you know, your tax burden, uh, that everyone doesn't have access to it. Thank you. Um, and so when you're utilizing your social media platforms as a as a uh, science uh, communicator, you know there are benefits, right? And there are risks of online communication and learning. Can you talk a bit about what those risks you have seen um, and how they have manifested themselves a bit in your work? Yeah, it's always part of the conversation when I'm talking to a young woman scientist um, when they're thinking about uh, becoming more active on social media. This is also true for all sorts of marginalized groups, not just women when it comes to uh, communicating on social media. Um, 
it's a really powerful tool. You can get a huge uh, group of people listening to you if you're lucky and effective. Um, but of course, that comes with with risks. Um, I run with a with a group of of uh, women scientists who have been uh, communicating on social media for a while, and each of us have a couple horror stories. Um, some of them you know, at the end of the day, turned out okay. Some of them not ideal. Um, there's a fair amount of stalking um, that can happen when you hit a certain number of people paying attention to you. So you have to be careful about the, um, like the pictures that you post. Is it very obvious from those pictures where you live? Um, that that sort of thing. It's like, it's, it's easy um, when, you know, we're all posting pictures of our vacations and what have you, uh, sorry. Um, to, to accidentally let slip more information than, than maybe is safe to do. So um, there are of course settings on some social media platforms that you can activate to, to prevent some of that. But a lot of it is just like getting your guard up early, like being as approachable as you can um, because that really is gonna impact the effectiveness of your communication while also really keeping it locked down on the information that people can use to identify you. There's also slightly less scary, but no less harmful um, stuff that can happen. You can have people in your um, direct messages on various platforms saying, horrible stuff to you. Maybe they're not stalking you. Maybe they don't live in your city, um, but it certainly weighs on you. I mean, there are, um, there's been a couple high profile, really um, sad suicide cases in um, particularly um, activism around black scientists in the last uh, couple months that have been, you know, it's just too much weighs on folks um, and it becomes too, too much. And um, that's something to keep a, an eye out for um, and knowing when to step away. Um, having strong support systems and maybe a therapist to help identify like this is getting to be too much. I need to just step away from social media for a month. I've had to do that in the past. I'm sure I'll have to do it again in the future. It's hard to, um, it's hard to navigate, uh, but uh, I think overall worth it uh, if, if it works well with your brain chemistry effectively. Thank you. Those are really, really important points that, you know, strategies that, that need to be taken into account when you weigh the positive and the negative, right, of, of online presence and the ability um, to at least have someone that you can talk these things out with and, and really know from your own personal experience, you know, when you need to step back and when you need to take care of your own mental health is, is very key. Um, and so, you know, you're online, you're a science communicator, you're engaging across all of these um, platforms, you know, ultimately, what would you like to see for the future of, of science education, um, particularly regarding, regarding online learning? And, um, you know, how would you also relate that to, you know, advice you give to a young person who's interested in exploring, exploring science? Yeah, I mean, I think that social media is such a powerful tool for us to see a incredibly wide variety of scientists. When you um, watch a, a sci-fi movie, it's gotten better in the last 10 years in terms of what those scientists look like, but not fast enough and it's not good enough. And there are so many ways to be a scientist, both in terms of the things that we study, the things that we do, and also how we look, the, our lived experiences, where we came from, et cetera. And so um, I just want to see more successful uh, science communicators that don't look like me, um, that look like a wide variety uh, of people that don't, uh, did, maybe didn't grow up in Philadelphia, maybe they grew up far, far away from Philly um, and uh, have different lived experiences. I think it's so valuable for people to see all of us and not just a couple of us. Um, I want there to be like a full suite of people that get attention and not just like Bill Nye. I want it to be a lot of us. Um, uh, I think that we've seen a lot of really cool, like the, the pandemic, mostly extremely bad for us, for our mental health, for the whole thing. But we got really creative at uh, getting interesting stuff happening online. I think right now we're pretty burnt out on uh, a lot of online stuff, but give us another year or two. I want to see a lot of the creativity that we've learned from the pandemic um, being used to make more engaging online content, more interactive online content, stuff for people to play with so that the communication that we're doing is two-way and not just delivering information to folks. Um, I think that's really, really important. Conversations, not lectures. 
I agree 100% because I am, I assume, I'm pretty confident that there isn't a person in this conversation right now um, who hasn't felt during the past few years that if they, um, you know, had to sit and be on another Zoom, you know, that they were going to go, you know, running out the front door and screaming down the sidewalk. Yeah. So, you know, the burnout can definitely be real. Well, thank you for, for sharing that great information and, and really thoughtful information, because you're right, there, there are the positives, but then we also have to think about, um, you know, some of the not so positive uh, things and indicators that, that take place. But in the end, you know, we want to encourage girls and young women to you know, become more adept at technology and to consider, you know, sort of, you know, not the traditional what everyone, you know, thought a scientist was, you know, 10 years ago. And I appreciate the way you are expanding the definition of what that means. So thank you. Uh, next, we're going to turn to Dr. Alicia Hayes. So um, Alicia, we know that gender gaps exist you know, not only in access and in the use and benefits of technology, but of course, in the participation and leadership in the development of technology and innovation. Uh, talk a bit about what gaps and biases that you've observed in the virtual reality and gaming spaces that hinder the access and participation of women and girls. Um. First, I love that you asked this question about participation and leadership. Um, I see this so often just on a small level. Uh, I tell my students all the time, problems are opportunities. <laughs> so there's this problem that is when I teach computer science classes, right now I'm in the Department of Learning Technologies, but I'm a computer scientist by training and have taught computer science for some years now. And when I'm in when I'm teaching computer science classes, there is just right there a very clear um, deficit of females in my classes. Um, so generally, if I have a class of 20 students, I might have two young women um, in, in the class. And that that has been true. That was true when I was an undergrad student too. But like there were a couple of other girls in my computer science classes. So there's already this sense of like not exactly belonging when you're in the courses. But then there's also, of course, the societal expectations that they don't push. And I, I mentioned I have daughters. My daughters experience the same thing. Um, my youngest daughter is in a physics class where there are two women. Uh, and she's a junior in high school. My oldest daughter is a senior in high school, and she's in an engineering class where there are three women, including her. So, so it's still, it's still an, it's still an issue. But again, problems are opportunities. So, what I see is that we all have this opportunity to just reach out to the woman that we do see, even tangentially engaged. And I've been able to do that, like pull girls who are like, oh, well, I'm just taking this one class in Python and my business degree. And I'm like, yeah, well, maybe you want to minor in computer science and, you know, and or someone who's like, well, yeah, I think I'm done with, with school and everything. And I'm like, yeah, but look at my lab. Isn't it so cool that I get to do all of this stuff? Have you thought about a PhD? And like, like just helping people re-envision what, what, what their features could be. And that is what happened to me. I, I, my parents wanted me to do computer science because they heard it paid well, right? But um, I thought it was boring, frankly. And I had a peer's parent who was a computer scientist back in the 90s tell me, oh, you, you would actually do really great. And I was like, I don't love it. And he's like, you don't have to love it. You just have to be good enough at it because you're a good communicator. You just have to be good enough at it to be the person who translates between the people who love it and the people who don't understand it at all. And to me, that was so so beneficial to think about um, there's like this gap where we fit. We don't have to be, you don't have to be the like, you don't have to rewrite a new programming language to be a computer scientist. Like there's there's a space for lots of different uh, personalities in here. Um, but I guess that's my introduction to your answer. Um, the other panelists have indicated that diverse representation is critical. I would also say for me, diverse representation is critical for the design and development of technologies because we as women experience things sometimes differently, not always, but sometimes differently. And I 
absolutely have witnessed this from the summer camp that, that we've hosted now for two years, where we have this summer camp that is based in design thinking principles, which means we start with empathy and we ask the girls, what are problems? Because problems are opportunities. Problems are opportunities to solve them. So what are problems that you have? And they come up with things. My favorite was boys. <laughs> but boys, Chromebooks, um, toxic parenting. These are things that middle school and high school girls came up with. And then they all uh, worked together to design technologies that would address them. And since my lab is an XR lab, we're trying to focus on using XR. But they started thinking about like, what are the what is the basis of how people are experiencing different problems and then started thinking of, them, of themselves as the people who could solve these problems and it was it's just so amazing to be able to see that and it, it is an absolutely necessary shift because we still have something like 25 percent of developers are women even though it's a kind of funny thing most of the time when i talk to students about gaming women are like, oh, I'm not really a gamer, but like upon further exploration, they're like, well, I play Candy Crush, you know, they're like, Candy Crush is a game, in fact. So yes, you are a gamer. I know maybe your son who plays Call of Duty wouldn't call you a gamer, but by definition and industry and this wealthy industry that has now overtaken the movie industry, um, women are actually 41% of gamers. And maybe we'd be more if people didn't have these stereotypes of who a gamer is and what we're allowed to look like. So that's also that's also an issue. Um, and then the other, I guess, kind of concern along this, sorry, I, I have some notes. So the other concern around this is when we're talking about the point of this is tech power to economic power. The fields that are most high paying are STEM fields. So when we alienate young women from these fields and don't even give them the consideration that they fit for them, we're alienating them from a $90,000 computer programming field that is in gross shortage, a $70,000 3D art film or field. So you're an artist. Well, you can use these tools to make your art something that more people experience and also make you um, prof have a profitable career ahead of you. Uh, and also, I will also, I, I don't wanna monopolize, but I would also say that there are many tools that we can transfer from when we teach girls these skills, like um, gamification, for instance, is this notion of taking the things that work in games and using them in other fields, for instance, there are insurance companies that gamify their website to get people engaged. There are health apps that gamify the experience like by adding leaderboards and, you know, co competition with your friends or just points and status and things like that. If you think of yourself as a gamer and you start analyzing these games that you play, the people who've been making them for years now have been using all kinds of behavioral science to shape human behavior most of us have at least one part of our life we would like to shape human behavior in. <laughs> so that's a thing that we can apply, but also most of us who have careers have areas that we could actually use elements of gamification, you know, el elements of ways to motivate people to stay engaged with your content, el elements of ways that maybe you want to encourage people to maintain a status that you're that is favorable for your organization, things like that. And then I, I will kind of conclude with um, the VR space. So in terms of disparities in VR use and development, um, there are many opportunities that young women don't consider in this space because right now we still have this notion in our minds that virtual reality is about games. Like, and, and someone's like, oh, so yeah, you get a VR headset because you want to play like a horror game with a headset on and you're immersed and it's terrifying. And I don't want to do that. So no, VR is not for me. But in truth, there are so many other areas of virtual reality. In fact, um, most women who do engage in virtual reality engage in social experiences or art apps or um, in my summer camp, we have lots of different educational things that other people have made, like Frontline has made a great piece on Greenland and how it's melting. Um, and there's the Anne Frank experience and many other immersive experiences. And we also know that in general, research has demonstrated that young women engage more with narrative-based experiences. This is in games and also just in 
other areas of engagement like um, literacy. So the fact that we have all of these narrative-based experiences in VR is an opportunity for them, but inversely, the opportunity for them to develop these experiences um, is really kind of unlimited right now. Uh, at, I think in 2015, Facebook hosted an event called Oculus Launchpad, where they brought many different women to the Facebook headquarters, and we all got to meet Palmer Lucky, the creator of the Oculus, and they taught a lot of people who had no computer science experience at all. They taught them just how to take 360 cameras, like one camera, or you can, you know, high-tech people with a lot of money can use like a bunch, like a whole rig of many, many cameras, but to create these panoramic videos of narrative experiences. And people have been making these to make experiences that teach people about homelessness. So that that idea of VR is the ultimate empathy machine. What is it like to be homeless? Like Bombs Over Sidra is another very well-known VR experience because virtual reality can provide people the opportunity to experience someone else's experience or walk in their shoes, as they say. So what we can do to engage young women with this is make them understand the capacity of the technology. And for me, I know this is true because I was a computer science major. I got a job. This tells you how old I am. I got a job making the Y2K changes at an aerospace company. I changed my major as an undergrad because I was like, this is so boring. I can't see myself doing this. And in my mind, that was it. I was like, that's computer science. And it took going through a master's and then actually getting my PhD back in the space of computer science and seeing the whole broad, really humongous world that exists and that computer science is part of all of it to realize all of the potential. So when we're talking about how do we engage young women and, and girls, women, young women with this technology, we really just need to make them understand what it is because we don't do a really good job of making young people or even adults understand what it is. Um, I could say more, but I Great. think that's, that's good. Well, <laughs> I'm wondering, thank you. I mean, that was that was pretty amazing. And particularly when we when you talk about the about VR and its impact um, and its utilization around social, cultural, and economic aspects. I can remember, I literally, I remember my first um, VR experience and it was actually at the United Nations. And, you know, it was one of those experiences where, you know, I was transported to another country and I was sitting right next to a stream where women were doing were doing laundry and um you know a chicken came up to me and it looked like it was about to come and sit in my lap and when I turned my head around I could see there were folks behind me walking around and because I had you know that kind of in-person experience uh in Africa myself the way in which it felt as though I could reach out and touch those women or reach out and have that experience it was even for even for someone who'd had that experience it was very transformative right so providing you know girls with the opportunity to experience something like that but also as you said to have the ability to walk in to walk in someone else's shoes is a very powerful experience as well um, talk a bit more about the about the Surge Lab and some of the the mentorship opportunities and and other ways that you're, you know, really supporting girls and young women's you know pursuit of STEM careers. Thank you. Um, okay, so the Surge Lab and you mentioned it, simulation, user research, and game experience. Um, the lab is designed in a way to replicate the things that have been most beneficial to me and my career development. So that, that's even why it is named what it's named because I focus on simulation, user research and game experience because those are things I particularly love. And I have found, like I, I mentioned, I dropped out of the computer science program and changed my major to psychology when I was an undergrad because I thought this is boring. 
So now I want to show people the things that I think are really fun about computer science and engage them with, with those parts of computer science. And um, so we're designed in this way, but I think the thing I'm most proud of about the structure of the lab, and, the, and also this is mirrored in the structure of the summer camp, is this scaffolding approach to teaching and mentoring. So the summer camp is for middle school and high school students, and that is designed in a way where we have volunteers, PhD students, and myself running the camp. But we also have high school students mentoring middle school students, and we have undergrad students mentoring high school students, and we have graduate students mentoring the undergraduate students. And then, of course, I'm centrally located to everyone for whatever they need, but I'm also regularly encouraging peer mentoring, which for me is not just about the data that shows us that, you know, young people enjoy being mentored by people closer to their age and closer to their level of experience, and maybe they find them more relatable. But also, it just makes I feel like it get, empowers everyone to see themselves as a mentor starting at the high school level and even at some level the middle school girls because I'm also encouraging them to be peer mentors so like we break into groups and it's like this is the thing we're working on for instance when we do user experience testing I'm like okay so we're all going to try the Greenland melting app and then maybe, and it's so good, by the way, uh, with VR, it's almost absolutely necessary that I have all of these peer mentors because you can't see what's going on with anyone once they put on a VR headset and they are immersed in another place. So you, you almost have to, you can't do a like front of the room to a whole group communication. They, they each sometimes need help. So having the peer mentor is like, oh, well, the person next to you is like, oh, you can't understand that. Let me help you. <laughs> and the, my screen is black. What do I do? And, and before I can even get there, one of their peers will be like, oh, let me help you. And for the summer camp, we really wanted this because particularly for the girls that we're targeting in low income schools, they very frequently have teachers who have less than five years of experience in the field, which means that their teachers don't really have the time to become an expert in VR and XR and you know the newest learning management system. They're just trying to get their head around classroom management and lesson plans. So part of what we wanted to do with the summer camp was empower the girls to also take back skills that they could teach their peers, but also take back that self-efficacy that they felt capable of teaching their peers. So um, that's kind of how our mentoring and uh, yeah, our mentoring and teaching is, is scaffolded. And that happens in the lab and outside of the lab. And, and I also really, like I mentioned before, try to encourage people when they're like on the fence. It's like, I, I just had a new master student start with me working on a project at the beginning of this academic year. And now she is in the PhD program. <laughs> so I was like very excited about that. And someone asked what percentage of the surge lab are women. And I don't know, but I'm, I'm gonna say more than half of our lab um, are, are women. And it's it's not that I have, um, have excluded young men because there are some men who are engaged, but I do, I actively recruit women. Like I actively seek out women that I'm like, I just, I see you and I don't want you to take this long detour away from computer science for six or eight years like I did. Let's keep you engaged. So if what it takes for you to stay engaged is someone to help mentor you and help you see the opportunities, then that's that's a problem that is now an opportunity. Um, so yeah. yeah. Definitely. Thank you. And And I'm wondering, I mean, the wonderful information that you shared. And I want to go back a bit to what you mentioned early on when you talked about the fact that you your your two daughters are each, uh, you know, taking a, a STEM related course that only has what two or three, one or two students. Um, and sort of, you know, for people who are in that same state with their own, you know, with their kids, what could be done, you know, to at the school level, right, to encourage administrators and, and teachers um, to really have an impact on the fact that we still aren't getting as many girls, you know, engaged in this, in this, in the classroom? You know, that's, that's a great question. And oh, I think, 
for like for for me as a parent um I think it would be nice if the school actually valued the parents and the students as possible mentors. And frankly, I do all of this outreach and I've never been invited to speak at my kids' school. So, so I mean, like there's like one example. I think that, again, I think that this problem is only really apparent to the people who are fighting for it. Now, I take responsibility for that because while I'm doing all of this outreach, I could do outreach to my kids' school, but I don't because I'm already busy. <laughs> So, so I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not putting it entirely on them, but as advocates, I guess maybe all of us, including myself, could be the people who are speaking to being the change that we want to see in the world and saying, I could say to the school, hey, if you want someone to talk to the kids, I can do it. And I've had the teachers, I have said that to some teachers and I've been like, yeah, sure, let's do that sometime. And then it just kind of fizzles away. So maybe I need to be more actively like, hey, you really need somebody to help these kids but also maybe at the higher level they could be encouraging the teachers to have these initiatives and of course i live in texas um where um to i i love texas and i'm very fortunate to have a tenure track position but i can also say that um, i'm sure people have seen in the news some some people going against ideas of promoting equity and inclusion in some parts of the country. And I think I live in, in, a, in a small community where that is sometimes sometimes an issue, where people don't want to seem like they're too progressive or something like that. So I, that, that may be a, a political thing. Unfortunately, it shouldn't be about politics, but I will say um, that my summer camp received a civil rights complaint because someone was upset that we were discriminating against men um, for girls surgeon to STEM. Luckily, the complaint didn't really go anywhere because I actually, even though the camp is girls surgeon to STEM, um, we didn't have enough people engaged that I had to exclude young men. And in fact, no young men applied. So I'm not sure who complained. <laughs> but so that's like that, but that's part of the culture now is maybe all of us need to be like, hey, we're not just, we're not trying to exclude men, but we do want equity. And it's like, until we have equity, this is an issue. Like if there are classes that are only women, we should also be seeking equity and trying to include more young men. Um, because frankly, there are disengaged students of all races and genders and socioeconomic backgrounds right now in our world. And, and, and as you're talking about with the pandemic, it's even worse. So mm -hmm. for sure, like if we could all get a mindset that equity matters for all people, <laughs> and right now we're talking about tech equity and pay gap, but if there are areas that men are disadvantaged, um, then they should also have equity, I think. Great. Yeah, but, but that's not an issue for, for my field. <laughs> right. No, not at all. Thank you. And and I and I asked that question in, in part also when I, I know that people are, are interested in it and it um, correlates to AAU, some of AAUW's current programming, like the national programming that we're doing, STEM Ed for Girls, where we have a you know, a parallel training and engagement for parents and caregivers, because, you know, as you said, you know, students may be participating and engaged in activities, and then they go home, and they don't have the support or the knowledge or the engagement of, you know, other, other parents, or, or they don't know how to go and, or answer the right, right, ask the right questions, or are familiar with the technology, etc. And so that is a um, a, a really important aspect of how girls can be supported to, you know, become more engaged in these careers is also by empowering and educating their parents and caregivers around what it what it all means and providing them with access to information. So thank you for thank you for sharing. Um, and and then your last comment around uh, men and you know, how we can engage men or what role that do men have to pay to support women and girls to, you know, eliminate this gap is also a really important question. And so I'd like for um, Sarah, if you could weigh in on that, sort of the engagement of men in eliminating this digital divide and, and what, what, what should that look like or what are the possibilities? Oh, that's a good question. Um... I mean, certainly we need men to take a moment. Like I, one thing I've noticed as we've been talking, did you notice that both 
myself um, and Alicia both said like, oh no, we're, we're, I'm talking too much. Both of us said that. Why did I say it? Why did Alicia say it? We're panel. So, you know, uh, it's funny to me that um, we are like making sure we're not talking too much, making sure we're sharing the stage with each other, which is be beautiful. That's what it should be. But how often do we see, you know, other folks doing that as well? Um, I think, you know, reminding them to, to share the stage. Um, this week in, uh, and last week in, in marine biology circles, we've also seen a lot of uh, panels that are all about um, the future of the ocean. Um, one's all about jellyfish and it's from these like, you know, prestigious marine science institutions. And many of the panelists are men, all of them in three, three out of three have been all white panels. There's no excuse for it. And so, you know, making sure there's an awareness in folks that, um, before you uh, agree to do something as you're organizing things, take a minute, stop, look around, see who's being represented um, and sort of examining how we're like the, the, the ways that we've always done things. Maybe that's in um, our, like in our communications, are we only using the internet to communicate? Are we forgetting that sometimes people don't have access to the internet, aren't using the internet in the ways that we do? Um, kind of balancing that out. Uh, you know, that's, that's an important step to take. Um, and uh, something that you can't, can't look over, because it's an essential step to doing things properly. Absolutely. Thank you. Cool, Nas? Yeah, I was um, actually reflecting on the um, recent paper I read for my <laughs> class on uh, Helena Morrissey, um, on uh, promoting 30% club in uh, London and I think she did a lot of work um, with men and uh, making sure that they they also want what she wants um, and I think that's like bringing uh, working with men also bringing them on board on this in this work and um, in Kazakhstan in case I think um, I think it's also educating parents and uh, uh, teachers on the future of uh, these girls and how it will affect uh, their economic mobility and not only they are part of the um, big household uh, issues right now, uh, but giving them the space to have this education. And in my case, um, that was very prominent when my mother gave me a lot of space to study instead of like being part of the um, I don't know, cooking and everything else. And she was like, that's that you'll figure it out. Now your work is um, kind of studying. And uh, that personally helped me um, to be where I am. And I think just a lot of uh, work in the side of our other constitu constituencies, I think is very important. Thank you. That those are those are really important points, and I think you mentioning the fact that you know your parent encouraged you on that side as opposed to sort of the always sticking with the traditional ways in which girls have been been socialized is important as well. So I want to ask all of you, sort of, you know, and I and I think uh, Alicia touched on this a bit, but sort of the notion of how you became engaged in science and technology and and what what aspect of growing up was sort of a pivotal moment when you were steered in that direction like when did you know was this for all three of us yes okay um i always loved animals and I didn't know like what what a scientist did I wasn't really sure my parents also didn't really know uh, what scientists did and I think a lot of that has has influenced um why I really want to put more scientists in front of people um but my parents were like well maybe um you'll be a dolphin trainer if you like animals maybe you'll work at the zoo or the aquarium um these are the only like animal jobs that they were aware of but I always knew like they wanted to encourage me however they could but weren't sure what to encourage me to do exactly. So they were just throwing anything at the wall to see what stuck effectively, um, which I appreciate them uh, trying their best. Um, but it really wasn't until um, I went to college and so met scientists that I had any sense of like how I could be, how I could both work with animals and, and be a scientist. Um, I didn't really even connect those two necessarily. I knew like, well, if I like animals, I should study biology and then we'll take it from there. Um, 
but certainly my parents were very, uh, you know, they'd take me down to the creek to to look at bugs and that sort of thing, uh, which is certainly very helpful. But um, I really didn't know until I got to college. Thank you. And I assume that there were no there were no squids in your local no creek. squids in Philly. Yeah, no, unfortunately no not. No. <laughs> But okay. there were tapes from the library that uh, my mom and I went to the local Bun Salem library, checked them out, and watched squids on the TV. So that's as good as we got in Philly. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Yeah, now I'm also reflecting on the, um, so my undergrad degree is on physics. Um, so um, I was trained to be a physics teacher and then taught math uh, for a while. So uh, but definitely there was uh, some kind of um, discomfort when I was applying because um, to the undergrad degrees, because it's usually where boys go to uh, study. So, um, but I, I distinctly remember when my classmates would say, okay, Golnaz, I don't understand this math concept. Can you explain me one more time? And um that's how I discovered I'm good at teaching and uh, also fell in love with physics uh, later on. But yeah, it wasn't the common place where um, where girls will go for, to study. Um, and uh, during the undergrad as well, most of my teachers were men in the higher education. Um, yeah, so still, I think it took some time for me also to participate in this kind of extracurricular activities, like such as Sarah and Alicia is doing. We had a lot of girls in STEM camps, or we have uh, women in tech communities now in Kazakhstan that helps to empower women. Um, so I think the um, first encouragement of my peers and the family helped me to go along this way. Um, but yeah, without not without some discomfort in this journey. And so as women who are working in this in this in this field, um, and for the most part, how now so many people are working remotely, what are this what are some strategies that you utilize to connect to each other in this remote world? Well, I sent, um, or I, I haven't sent, but will send LinkedIn requests to the people on the panel <laughs> and um, email. And I will, uh, back to what Sarah was saying about Twitter, um, academic Twitter is amazing. Like I, I'm able to connect with people after I read an article by them and then they, like we can actually have a conversation. It used to be you just read an article. Um, I, I, I read a lot of Sean Jin Wright's books when I was in my master's program. And for some reason, I was just like, I wonder if he's on Twitter. And of course he is. <laughs> so it's like, oh, wow, that's this genius person that normally I would just read their books. Now I can like actually know their stream of conscience from time to time on Twitter and also connect with people. And similarly for the summer camp, um, every day we had different professionals like women in STEM speak to the girls. So um, a lot of those women in STEM I found on social media, like I'd see someone posting about their biology background or whatever, even so much so that like I found some of the people at my own institution, not at my institution, but looking for women in North Texas in biology or in chemistry on Twitter. And I was like, oh, perfect. Someone at my school. This is great. So, so yeah, I absolutely uh, find it a great place to connect with others. But I love that Sarah also was bringing up the idea that we sometimes forget that everyone doesn't access the internet. And I, um, I honestly have have not been thinking in those terms, but I think that's going to help expand access to some of the programs that we try to create. So thanks for that. Yeah, I think different um, career stages should have different approaches here. If you're just starting in um, your scientific career um, or, or tech career broadly, yeah, going on social media and connecting with folks that are already well connected in those spaces is incredibly powerful and a really good thing you can do. Um, one thing I like to remind folks once they're established, once they've been in it for a while, is that it is really easy for us to forget how people who aren't in that community, what they think about, what they're talking about, um, what's what's most 
most concerning to them. Um, and so, of course, I'm in science communication. So one of the big things I'm trying to do is take the conversations that we have within science and tech and bring them out to everybody else. And so one connection point that I've been trying to do, I engage with the um, the Neighbors Association, but I've also looked for uh, third spaces in my local community. So that's not your house and not your school slash work. Um, something else. Maybe that's a church. Maybe that's a co-working space. Maybe that's, you know, um, a sports team or, or uh, Dungeons and Dragons Club, whatever it is that's not um, work or school to um, hang out with people um, and be in community with people who aren't in the same fields as you to get sort of like almost a reality check sometimes on um, what everybody else is is thinking about talking about. Um, that's been super valuable for me in in my work. I love that. That's such a good point. Such Thank a good point. Yeah, I want to double tap on what Sarah said on outreaching the people that are outside of our bubbles. Um, so that's what we try to do with the programs with Connected. Uh, so for example, this uh, cohort, we have teachers signed up uh, for our digital literacy programs. Um, and it, I think it's very great that we are uh, trying to reach people outside who typically sign up for this kind of programs. And uh, one of our uh, work is uh, needs assessment when we try to just collect the information from the people in different communities and um, ask what they use and uh, what kind of platforms they use uh, mostly. So we heavily utilize um, platforms such as Instagram because we know like mostly every person in Kazakhstan probably have some account and we know um, that uh, information would be accessible there than maybe like in LinkedIn, for example, or through email. Um, we heavily use WhatsApp chats um, to outreach our, um, our audiences. And I think, yeah, this kind of small steps um, will help us to go a long way. Very good points. You know, I see someone asked a question uh, when in talking about social media. A good point it says, um, and we've seen this happen over the past few months as, as folks have been sort of wavering around what to do about Twitter, given the ongoing controversy. And the question is, have you thought of a backup plan to maintain your Twitter contacts if Twitter tanks? This is a thing that keeps me up at night because uh, Twitter is the thing that connects me to people the most. I work by myself. Like when I, um, I, I work by myself with no coworkers and my, it's me and cats over here. Uh, and so Twitter is the way that I socialize a lot of my day when I'm not going to my coworking space. Um, so I, if Twitter tanks, I'm going to have to come up with a strategy, but a lot like um, thinking about like diversifying investments, like it, social media is the same. So when, um, just do a couple different ones all at the same time. And even if one is your favorite, like for me, Twitter's my favorite. I like uh, putting quick little thoughts out there all day long. Uh, but I'm also really trying to remind myself, like also invest time in Instagram, also invest time in Mastodon, also invest time in Tumblr. Tumblr, by the way, still active and uh, has more women on there than any other platform. I started in social media on Tumblr because when I was first starting, my goal was to reach young women with with squid like marine biology content and I was like which of these platforms has the most women and the least women the least women reddit so I was like no and then the most women was was tumblr so I was like that's my that's my spot anyway um diversifying is so important and um just the ones that are the most most important to you make sure that you, you can even just dm people say do you have any other platforms remind people by tweeting um or or instagramming or whatever um hey I'm also on these other places. So remind, remember, you can follow me there too. I think we're all kind of aware on um, Twitter that there's a chance um, that we're a sinking ship. We're not really sure yet. Um, I think some uh, confidence has been restored, but then, you know, something strange happens on a given Tuesday and everything else falls into question again. So um, yeah, diversifying, reminding your followers and your community members that you can, you can find each other elsewhere. Matchups. 
Thanks, Sarah. Um, I, I appreciate all that you have shared with us, all three of you have shared with us today, um, not just about the incredible work that you're all doing, but the ways in which you really, I feel like, you know, have inspired us to, to sort of take this information and be more active and engaged in our own communities and our workplace, you know, in our schools, it's really important. Um, but I have one last question around, you know, how can we, ensure that the issue of closing the gender digital divide stays at the top of stakeholders' agendas? Um, what would you recommend? My biggest recommendation is when you're when you're in conversations with these stakeholders, directly ask them how are you how are you reaching people? Do you have a communications strategy that branches out to people that aren't online. Um, just asking that question, they may not have thought about it before. Um, just because people are powerful and reach a lot of people, it doesn't mean that they're thinking about things as critically as they should be. Um, so inquiring and reminding them that people don't, people exist in many different ways is a, an important first step. Excellent, thanks. Gunas or Alicia? Yeah, I think for me, um, this kind of event was very, very important because I think I was working in this digital uh, divide issue for three years, but it's it's been, it didn't happen because of the COVID, it just got exacerbated, right? So mm -hmm. I think bringing urgency around the issue and awareness is very important and how uh, it is affecting the lives of girls and women um, every day. Um, and even in our work, we see, uh, some kind of skepticism around, oh, how come like kids are digital natives now and how come they don't know how to use this equipment, right? Or um, I don't know how there's no households without equipment and things like that. So bringing more awareness and urgency around this issue, I think is really important to keep the needle forward. Thank you. Alicia? I, I love that, uh, Gomez, about them being digital natives now. It's it is it is a thorn in my side this notion <laughs> and and i i love that you bring that up and i i would i would just add to that and say um from my perspective since i i get some kind of sometimes pushback on pushing for equity i would say that we can ensure that they stay engaged with this topic by reminding them that there is not only an equity issue there is a shortage we lack sufficient um, STEM workers in our country, particularly computer scientists, information technologists, um, environmental scientists, like these are areas that actually have critical shortages, healthcare, critical shortages. So if someone is resistant to the idea of equity, then maybe what we could do is say, do you know that we have all of these women, <laughs> kind of like, you know, um, the, the war brought women into the workforce. It's like right now we have a critical shortage in these areas and our failure to engage women in these fields is leaving us at a deficit in our communities, in our nation and in our world. We don't have enough people to do the jobs that we need done. And people are pretending that AI and robots can fill a lot of spaces in the near future that they simply, as a computer scientist, I can tell you they simply can't. <laughs> so we still have space for a lot of people and particularly a lot of women to step into roles of problem solving using these tools that will not only address the thing we should care about, which is equity and fairness, but if we don't care about equity and fairness, we can remind the stakeholders that they at least should care about the safety of our nations. And, and and we can be the solution to many of the problems that we have. Absolutely, absolutely. brilliant point. And I'll, and I'll let you know that my youngest daughter just graduated with a degree in environmental science. So there's one more who is joining the ranks. Thank you all hey. so much. This has been, this has just been an incredible conversation and I can tell by the activity in the chat and, and the comments and the questions, you know, that, that hopefully folks will, will really be thinking about so many of the gems that were dropped. I want to thank you for your time. Uh, we know everyone's time is so valuable these days. And of course, for your insight and your knowledge and for being with us this afternoon. I mentioned at the beginning, 
the recording will be posted on the AEW website in you know a few days and and um you'll be able to access it i want to also thank my AAUW team for support on the zoom today um AAUW uh, does have consultative status with the economic and social council and we certainly salute the un commission on the status of women and ngo csw um, for their work in supporting our parallel event today we really appreciate it uh, and so in closing, technology and innovation present incredible benefits and risks for women and girls' social, educational, and economic empowerment on a global scale. Uh, as UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres emphasized in his message to commemorate International Women's Day that women today make up under a third of the workforce in science, technology, engineering, and math. And when women are underrepresented in developing new technologies, discrimination may be baked in from the start. AAUW wants women creating that digital table, not just having a seat. And as we face backlash and even regression in girls and women's rights all across the world, we must continue to find strength in the fight for equity and efforts to bridge these deepening divides. We hope today's conversation has left all of you with opportunities for action and renewed hope that we can all, that we can and will achieve a more just and equitable world for all. And as UN Women Executive Director Seema Bahos declared last week, let us assert that digital rights are women's rights. Thank you all for your participation. Please visit AEW.org and learn more about our research, advocacy, education, our career boosting training, and funding for women to close the gender digital divide. Thank you and have a great afternoon. Thank you.